to Invent Living Movement Ireland's International Women's Day celebration. My name is Selina Bonney and I am the Vice Chair of Isla Mide. And my description is that I'm a not quite white Indian Irish woman. I'm wearing a red top and have grey spiked hair, purple glasses, chilly red lipstick, thanks to my daughter, and long earrings. Tonight, we pose the question, do we need equality before equity? Over the course of the evening, we will explore the difference between equality and equity from the lived experience of women and disabled women in particular. ILMI is a disabled persons organization that is underpinned by a core belief of inclusion, self-determination and human rights. And so this event is open to all days. We lost our dear Judy Human um, from the US over the weekend. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the work and contribution that Judy has made internationally to the disabled persons human rights movement, um, not just in the US, which she was known as like the mother of independent living and the mother of the movement, but really her, her contribution and her impact has, has been worldwide. And um, in Ireland, we have a lot to thank Judy for, for her mentorship and her solidarity, particularly in relation to, to education. Many people may not realize the work that she did when the, the legislation was being developed. But for me personally, as someone who had the pleasure and honor of knowing Judy and spending time with her, it was quite a shock at the weekend to hear of her passing. And it also made me think of, we've lost many other strong disabled women internationally over the years. And I know personally, I knew people such as Gordana Rykov in Serbia, who we lost within the last year, and Ursula Hegarty, Florence Dougal here in Ireland, and so many other women that I'm sure you all hold it within your individual hearts. So um, it's really lovely to actually be here all together tonight so soon after after losing our Judy and I and just to remember and to know that all those disabled women that have gone before us they're still with us whether it's in our minds in the work we do or in our hearts they'll they'll never be far as strong women on our good days we have an obligation to give back to our peers our community our allies and of course to each other I say good days because we all understand the strength of will and often strategic and creative planning that it takes to live as disabled women and not all days are good. Together we can have more good days and be stronger in our collective power. The reality is we have more in common with each other than what sets us apart. In this virtual auditorium, we are one and thank you for coming. Thank you for taking that leap. Thank you for sharing your time and thank you for being strong. Language is important. How you refer to yourself, the inner dialogues and the dialogues you have with the world around you. We believe language is not always only words. It is fashion, technology, writing, singing, humor, beauty. There is equality and equity in expression. We use what inspires us as women to create interactions with those we love, with each other, those around us, and more importantly, ourselves. Share with us this experience tonight as we explore through these extremely talented and thought-provoking guests, our common language and our combined power as women. Thank you. Selena, and, and my name is Fiona, and, and I'm only one of a fabulous team of women that work for IMI and I'm a proud disabled woman, a fabulous wife. I don't know what my husband would say about that, but I hope he'd agree. And I'm a mother, a daughter, and I love, love shoes and handbags. <laughs> and I have blue eyes and have long brown hair with some highlights tight. To my, to my wonderful hairdresser, and I'm wearing a black sparkly long dress, and I have purple nail varnish. 
Our first guest this evening is Dr. Rachel Hurst. Dr. Rachel Hurst is, is a disabled woman. She is also a disability activist and academic and has written countless papers and articles in relation to disability rights and activism. She is a total diva, diva and I'm totally honoured to have gotten to know her over the past few months. I will now share with you a recording that we made together just for this event. And I've been a disability rights activist since the late 70s. And it has been my incredible pleasure to travel around the world, meeting with disabled people, talking with disabled people. And they have written to me and we have recorded their lows and their wishes. And it is in fact a collection of letters from disabled people around the world that induced the UN bring in the Convention on the Rights of Disabled People. One of the greatest problems that we have now is that everybody talks about racism, quite rightly, and sexism. It's, it's this problem about people's understanding of the word disabled. Society for centuries tried to say that impairment and disability was our fault. And when the few disabled thinkers came together and outlined the reality of the social model of disability, do we have got to the truth. To show you an example of the disabling factor, I think I'll bring you all up to COVID. And COVID is very interesting because lockdown disabled everybody. It said you can't go out of your house. And if you do, you've got to wear this and you've got to do that. You've got to do the other. And that was disabling us. And I found it quite interesting that disabled people probably were more able to cope than non-disabled people. It's COVID because everybody was in lockdown. New things have arisen, which makes life for disabled people better, less disabling, because it's the social disabling factors that cause our problems and of the discrimination, not our impairments. Where we become the, the people who are deemed to be inferior is when we can't do what other people do because of the barriers in society and the discrimination arises from not recognising those barriers, not recognising that we are human beings and we have a right to equality, to freedom and to justice. We've got to get this message across. And those buggers out there have got to understand. And how do we do that? It's about coming together. And it's very important that you come together, not just as disabled people, but also the other groups for them to understand. And I just get infuriated at this constant talk about other people's discrimination. They never mention disabled people. We have to be mentioned. We have to be seen. We must always remember that disabled people were the first people to be killed in the gas chambers. And we mustn't forget it, but normal society. So our voice has got to be louder. I've, I've had to um, chair many a, a meeting from UN to government uh, advisory committees. And one of my golden rules has always been to try and make everybody laugh because it binds people together. That's what it's all about. Because I can think of nothing better than being with different groups and sharing and being together. But share with love, and with love will come justice and freedom and equality. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. That was amazing. And um, I'll over to Nicola. Okay. Hi. My name is My name is Nicola, and this has been a fantastic um, project. Working with, I really, really enjoy working on this project with my colleagues in ILMI. Um, I have uh, brown hair with brown highlights. Um, I'm wearing I'm glasses, 
and a black jumper with a sparkly design on my left shoulder. Left shoulder. Um, I, um, I, I, one of the um, most exciting parts of this uh, project has been getting to know some of the special guests. So I'm really, really excited to introduce um, Elaine Short. Elaine is uh, an American um, computer scientist uh, who specializes in, uh, re our research specializes in robotics and ways to make it practically beneficial to people with impairments. As a, as a disabled woman herself, she is a strong advocate of disability rights and creating an inclusive environment within the tech, within tech. So over to you, I, uh, Elaine. Um, all right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Elaine Short. I am an assistant professor at Tufts University on the East Coast of the US in Massachusetts near another small university you've probably never heard of. We're down the street from Harvard. Um, I know lots of people haven't heard of that place, but um, you know, they're sort of like our less cool siblings. Um, I am a white woman. I have short brown hair. I'm wearing a giant white sweater, giant blue glasses and giant headphones. So you can just sort of imagine uh, it's a lot of look. Uh, I have limb girdle muscular dystrophy. I mentioned specifically mostly. So if there's anyone else out there with the same rare disease, we can have solidarity with each other. Um, I use a variety of mobility devices to get around. I use a cane, a wheelchair, a mobility scooter. Um, and I've been managing this progressive disability while pursuing an academic career um, really sort of throughout the US. Um, so I am a roboticist, and when roboticists speak, um, people, all people really want to uh, see is pictures yeah, of robots. So, um, so um, I have brought pictures of robots. I'm going to tell you a little bit how I got into robotics, um, show you a bunch of pictures of me with robots and, I guess, doing fun science. I guess a skull is technically not a robot. Um, and I am going to describe all the pictures but uh, feel free to ask me in the question and answer if you want some more details on what's in the pictures. Uh, I did my undergraduate at Yale University, another place that is uh, you've probably never heard of. And uh, the I started out as a biomedical engineering major. So I have some pictures here from my BME days. Um, there's a picture of me holding up a skull next to my face. Uh, the skull has little colored markers on it. Um, and this is uh, from an imaging study we were doing, looking at different ways of being able to track bones in the body. Um, and then there's a second picture of me at, uh, well, I'm wearing scrubs and I'm sitting at uh, what looks like a, I don't know, giant gray lump. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. Piece of technology. Um, it's actually the interface for a da Vinci surgical robot. Um, so this is a the most expensive robot I have ever touched in my life. It costs about one and a half million dollars, which is, uh, you know, somewhere around a million uh, euros. I don't know what it is in pounds or if that's even the right, uh, the right currency. Um, but that gives you a sense. It's a lot of, it's worth a lot of money. Um, and this was my first internship, but it turns out I learned as a biomedical engineering major that I am squeamish and, uh, I got really grossed out by all of the bio, the bio part of biomedical engineering. Um, so I switched my major into computer science, um, and got into social robotics. Uh, so I have two pictures here of my social robotics career. I have a picture of me scolding a little tabletop robot. Uh, the robot's about a foot and a half tall. It has a uh, big white googly eyes and it's wearing a baseball cap and a shirt. Um, and I am, uh, I've got one finger up like I'm scolding it. Um, the research we were doing was actually on what happens when robots misbehave. Uh, and a second picture of me with a actually a local middle school teacher that's teaching uh, 12 to 14 year olds. Um, and uh, I was part of their robotics club. I was the college student who was helping out with the club. Um, and I'm sitting at a computer looking at the computer and the teacher is standing at a table and on the table is a Lego robot. 
Um, so I was a first Lego League advisor I graduated, I graduated um, for in the middle that. of a recession. Cool. And there also really weren't robotics jobs for people who are a um, for people who wanted to do social robotics. So that's robots that interact with people. So I went to get my PhD and uh, I've got to work with a lot of cool robots. So I have a variety of pictures of me with robots, including an Aldebaran Now robot, which is a, again, another like child sized robot, but it's white. Um, and it is probably one of the robots that people are most likely to have seen before. Um, they are a, uh, I don't know, what I would say they look they are humanoid robots so it looks like a little person um, and I'm holding it on one side and standing and smiling at the camera um there's a a picture yeah sure we can go to that one next um I so I, I worked with robots of all different sizes and all different cuteness levels uh so I have a picture of me with bandit um bandit has a gray face and red lips and silver eyes and is the second hit on Google for creepy robot. Uh, and so, uh, and I worked with cute robots. So there's a picture of me with some of my colleagues and we're all sitting behind a cute fluffy robot um, whose name is Dragonbot. Uh, we have, I also have worked with robots of different sizes. So there's a picture of me with uh, seven different robots, including a blue robot that is basically has a screen on the top of it. Uh, more of the bandit robots, which look like the top half of a person with gray faces. There are three of those. Uh, two Aldebaran Now robots, which are uh, sitting. Those are the small white humanoids. Um, and then after, oh, and the PR2, which is a gigantic, uh, it looks sort of like a refrigerator with arms and a head. Um, and it is uh, about four and a half feet tall in the configuration there. Uh, in my after my uh, PhD, I got really interested in bigger robots that can actually physically do things in the world as a person with a mobility impairment. Very interesting to me to have a robot that could actually do things. Um, and so I worked with bigger robots, including uh, there's a picture here of a robot. Uh, where I'm working on the robot's head and uh, I've got the, it, well, really it just looks like I'm working on a piece of technology sitting, uh, looking at it. But uh, there's a picture of me standing next to a similar robot that's almost as tall as I am. And so it's about five and a half feet tall. Uh, and it looks, uh, it's sort of triangularly shaped. It has a round head and one uh, one arm, uh, that is actually an arm you'll see on my current robots, uh, which is a robot, an arm that's designed to be used on wheelchairs. I have my own lab. I have a number of wonderful students and I've put all their pictures up. There's a picture of four of my students posing with one of our robots and uh, headshots of all of the different uh, students. And they are a, a fairly diverse bunch uh, and do you know, fabulous work, and I really enjoy working with them. Uh, I have pictures of my robots, which are, again, sort of vaguely humanoid, one-armed robots. Uh, they have gray heads, and gray, gray heads, gray but they, uh, sorry, I'm getting okay. feedback. Sorry, am I out of time, or is that just somebody accidentally put their mic on? Yeah, sorry, Elaine. I think somebody just put the mic on. Okay. I just want to be uh, somewhat mindful of the time because I'm a professor and we can talk for a long time. Uh, but I want to make sure I describe all my photos. Uh, so robots, one-armed. Uh, this picture of me posing with the robots. Um, and then the last thing, if you scroll down, I just want to say I do a lot of work with the disability community. I really love the disability community. I have logos of a bunch of different organizations. The ones I really want to highlight, um, Access SIGCHI, which does a does work on trying in the uh, CHI community, which is C-H-I um, for the interpreter, like the Greek letter. Um, and it is a um, it's an organization that is in the human computer interaction community and works to try and make that community more accessible. And uh, my current research is very inspired by 
disability rights and what I think of as like the disabled perspective um, as a disabled person uh, and uh, really trying to think about what assumptions do engineers make about what is normal? Um, and I put normal very much in scare quotes, uh, how that affects the design of artificial intelligence. Uh, I think about how robots and people with disabilities can actually work together to accomplish tasks instead of assuming the robot is gonna swoop in and just fix everything. Um, Cause actually people with disabilities are pretty good at doing stuff and robots as it turns out are pretty bad at doing stuff. So the model where the robot's gonna just do everything really doesn't work. Um, and I'm interested in developing robots that work for disabled people, not for caregivers or doctors. And how does that change how we think about the design? Uh, and I, of course, care a lot about getting more disabled people into robotics and into engineering. So I do work with students and trying to make our field more uh, Shelby, accessible. Thank you so much for joining uh, us tonight. Thanks. I'm such a huge fan. I love your work. Shelby is a 25 year old fashion and beauty influencer from the UK. Her Instagram is at ShelbyKinsXO. Um, as I say, your work, it's so impactful and it's so relatable. You were recently on the cover of Glamour magazine and I just thought your story on the article was incredible. As I say, just very to the point, um, you know, you've covered so many issues and I feel like a lot of your experiences, a lot of disabled women can relate, which I think is so important. And... I absolutely envy your wardrobe. I think your style is absolutely Aww. fabulous. And as I say, I'm just so thrilled that you're here with us tonight. So thank you so much for joining us. And over to you, Shelby. Hi. My name is Shelby. I'm a lynch and my pronoun are she, her. I've got um, a long blue and black in, and I've got a makeup on and I've got a pink t-shirt. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to talk about uh, like what I do basically like um, what I do on social media platforms and stuff like that uh, I put myself as a content creator and a model and a disability actress so I pretty much have been making content for about six years now like on and off but it's got a lot more serious the last couple of years so my name is Bob. I'm on TikTok and on Instagram. So I talk a lot about disability-related topics, which could include anything but like disability and sexual relationships, all the way just ableism in general. So I talk a lot about topics like that. And I also try to educate non-disabled people because I feel like there's a lot of stereotypes that go with being disabled. So I try and debunk a lot of those through like humor and just education. And then there's the other side where I talk about fashion. And I like to dress up like a brat doll. That's sort of like my little thing that I like to do. So I just do something like brat clothing and just show that disabled people can be beautiful and receptive. There's like such a stereotype that disabled people can't be glamorous. And like I was a 25 year old girl, like this well, woman, and we could all just wear what we like, and we could all be sexy and just live our best lives, is basically what I try to talk about. But I'm basically, my main goal in life is also to break down, like, not break down, like, the chick is the fashion industry. So, we have more disabled models. Clothes are more adapted for disabled people. And recently, I was supposed to be in London Fashion Week, but unfortunately, I got really good well. So I had to go to hospital so I couldn't make it. But yeah, in the future, I could take part in that again. And yeah, that's my main goal. Um, well, so I got said. So yeah, um, I don't know. So on the TikTok, that's my main platform where I jump into a lot of trolls. Because I feel like as a disabled content creator, a lot of us get quite a lot of hate comments, which obviously is like not nice. And I try and advocate my community 
I don't think I've any of my friends and stuff like that. I feel like TikTok have been quite... You've got to have really thick skin to do TikTok videos, I think. On Instagram, I feel like your audience is a lot more created to your personality. So they don't judge you as much. But on TikTok, you your videos could go absolutely anywhere. But a lot of people can be a lot more judgy, which obviously is like not great. But yeah, um, I've got a question I went off with that. Great, thank you so much. Abby, thank you so much. It was absolutely fantastic. And, and please stay to the end if you can to answer any questions. So we will um, move on now to Louise Bruton. Next, uh, Louise, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, I absolutely love your work. I think you're absolutely fabulous. You're a woman of many, many talents. So you're a, she's a freelance journalist, pop culture enthusiast, you're a disability rights activist, you're um, a DJ, and uh, I'm absolutely thrilled to have you here speaking with us this evening and that you're one of our guest speakers. And as I say, your work is just absolutely fantastic and you're talented in so many areas. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about your work. And I know you've recently restarted your, your column at Legless in Dublin and your, your subscription is actually free to disabled people, which I think is fantastic. So thank you so much for joining us and over to you, Louise. Thanks very much, Paula. So I'm Louise. Um, I'm a white woman in a wheelchair with blonde hair that's in need of a bit of a top up. Um, I am currently sitting in my kitchen, which is quite cold. And I've got two dogs that are running around me. So I'm really sorry if they bark at any point. Um, I timed it badly with their chew toys and one is finished and one is not. So they're at war with each other. Um, so I am a music journalist, I'm a DJ, I'm a public speaker, I'm a playwright, I'm a TV writer, I'm an author, I've got a newsletter, but before all of that, I am a disabled woman. And there is a huge level of unpaid work that goes with being an, a disabled person and having to accommodate the non-disabled people who hire me. I find that almost every job I go into, I have to make the non-disabled people more comfortable so that they feel like they're saying the right things for me or that they're providing the right services for me. That's my barking dog. <laughs> but um, so there's a lot of additional work that goes into the work that I have to do. And that is to make sure that the surroundings I find myself in are actually suitable um, and that the people working with me are actually comfortable with dealing with, with disability. So I'm very sorry for any of the mayhem that may occur. Um, no but problem. anyway, I found that I was doing all of this additional work um, making non-disabled people feel, feel comfortable. I was doing a lot of writing about my personal life, which kind of delved a lot into the traumas of being disabled. And I found that there was a lot of pressure on me to share huge elements of my private life. Um, and the cost was taking a huge toll on me. So I made a decision in 2021 to stop writing about my personal issues as a means of activism because I felt that disabled, non-disabled people just weren't listening. They weren't stepping up as the allies that they should be, because I found that the, the more I wrote, I found that I had to keep revisiting the same issues around access that they just weren't understanding. So I was really kind of questioning, what was the point in doing this work if the people who were meant to be listening were actively not listening? And it harks back to what Rachel was saying at the very start of, there's a lot of protests going on around the world and there's a lot of um, this great campaign work happening in so many different areas um, around racism and sexism and classism and poverty. And I always find that disabled people are our causes, our concerns, they're always at the bottom of the pile. And I was wondering of ways that I could try and change this. And a friend of mine who's um, a trans man, the two of us have always have these conversations about bathrooms where people always ask us about the correct, correct etiquette or in bathrooms. Who should use which bathroom? If you're a trans man, non-trans man, if you're disabled, non-disabled, which bathroom should you use? And myself, my friend, we both made the joke of like, if only we could charge people for asking us these questions about bathrooms. And then I realized, hang on, I can, I can do this. And that's with my new newsletter. So I used to have a blog called Legless in Dublin 
um, because as well as a wheelchair user, I'm also an amputee. And Legless in Dublin is an access review blog um, that reviewed restaurants, music venues, everything you name, um, you name it in terms of access and in terms of the venue itself being good or not. Because my argument is, what's the point of having good access if what's inside isn't good enough either? So I went back to the old format of what Legless in Dublin is. And I decided to create this new newsletter um, where I will write about my personal issues as a disabled woman. I will write my reviews um, around access, but I will charge a fee for non-disabled people because they are the people who need to basically pay up and do the work and improve how they can make this world better for us because we keep educating, but the people who keep asking for the lessons just aren't listening properly. and by providing this service for free to disabled people, I'm trying to serve my community in the way that I know how, and that's by sharing information, um, sharing connections, getting to know that there's someone who's like you or someone who's completely not like you, but has a, a similar set of beliefs in the next town or in the next country over or wherever they are in the world. Um, because disabled people, we can rarely congregate in real life. So our, I don't know, our town hall is the internet. And that's what I want the newsletter to be. It's a place where all disabled people can access for free, where we can communicate, where we can get to know each other, but where if disabled people want this information, they have to pay up. <laughs> so I'm basically handing out my hat my and clanking it around so people <laughs> will give me money um, because as disabled people, we do so much unpaid labor. And I think it's time that we realize that we're not an education program. We're, we're not, um, it's not our duty to make sure that other people are comfortable with how we are. We've, uh, uh, we spend enough time to make ourselves comfortable in our own skin and it's not our job for other people to feel comfortable around us. Um, so that's the, the rebirth of Legless in Dublin. And if anybody wants to get a free subscription, um, you can contact me here, give me your email address or you can contact me on Twitter um, and all I need is your email address and then you have a lifelong free um, subscription hey, for life. Uh, my name um, is Claire so Kenny. I am so ILMI's policy assistant. To audio describe myself, I am a white woman with light brown hair, um, done in an up style. My eyes are blue and I'm wearing a glittery purple eyeshadow with blue square framed rims and pink lipstick. My dress is a one-shouldered black dress decorated with pink and purple flowers. I'm delighted uh, to be introducing the fabulous Caprice. Caprice is a 21-year-old successful model, blogger, jewellery designer and business owner. She has been at the forefront of the inclusion revolution since 2019. Caprice has walked the catwalk in London Fashion Week and worked for Next, Doc Martens, ASOX and much more. Caprice has also shared her uh, story of self-acceptance in Cosmopolitan magazine. Uh, she has also worked on several BBC shows, uh, you know, glow up to name one but a few. Um, and she's also been a cover girl on a uh, Glamour uh, third edition. And uh, it's called Self Love. Um, yeah, so welcome Caprice. Hello, thank you. Thank you so much for the amazing introduction. That was amazing. Hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, my name is Caprice. Um, today, um, I'm a black woman. Today, I'm wearing earrings that say Queen from my brand. My hair's in a bun and I'm wearing a black top with like puffy sheer sleeves. Um, so yeah, again, thank you for that amazing introduction. Um, uh, I am a disabled model and jewellery designer. I became disabled at 10 years old, um, suddenly, after dislocating my knee. Um, and it was kind of like, God, it took a massive toll on mental health to navigate through that, through my teenage years, um, to the age that I am now at 21. Um, disabled was, in a way, there was so much stigma surrounding that word. Um, so I hated it. I just didn't like it when I was younger. So my mum was the main person that really instilled that confidence and self-love in me. 
um and she's the one that really like just told me to just embrace my disability embrace the mobility aids and just yeah embrace it all um and for me being um, a black disabled woman I didn't see myself being represented um especially with like my natural hair I didn't really see that um growing up um so that's why I became a model because I wanted to see myself being represented um, and like just mentioned um, I've gone on to work with some brands I was just recently on the cover of Glamour um, so that's just some positives um, regarding that um, but it hasn't always been positive um, like I said before I've had to just you know try and you know embrace myself embrace my disability and going through education, um, that has not been easy as well. I've dealt with a lot of um, disability discrimination in education um, from secondary school. Um, so my mom took me out of secondary school to homeschool me, which was ultimately the best decision she could, could have ever made for me. Um, and after that, I actually found a college myself and I've always been into fashion. So I was like, yeah, I wanna you know, study fashion. I wanna do this. Um, so that was amazing. And then I got into another college um, and I experienced discrimination again. Um, I just feel like I wasn't being treated equally um, compared to my non-disabled counterparts. Um, so I made that decision to leave. And yeah, I started university. And again, I experienced the same thing. Um, I went there to just, um, what's the word? Just uh, learn more skills to develop my jewelry brand. Um, and they failed to put my reasonable adjustments in place. Um, so I actually put in a formal complaint, fought for my rights, and I got some policies changed. Um, and for me, it was like I was doing it for myself, but I was doing it for every single disabled person that was studying there and will, will be studying there in the future. Um, so that was amazing. But after that experience, I just said, you know what, I think I need to put my heart and soul into my jewellery brand, um, and that's what I'm doing now. Um, the reason why I started my jewelry brand was just to empower people. I remember being in hospital one day and I wanted a way to just make myself feel better. So I put on a pair of earrings and um, I just felt so empowered. And that's kind of my mission now of my brand, to make people feel so empowered. Um, and yeah, I'm currently doing like loads of pop-ups, uh, pop-up shops throughout London, uh, where I'm able to meet like loads of people in person and just, just have that, you know, experience and just seeing how my jewelry makes people feel it just means so much to me um so yeah have I got everything out there um yeah I think that's everything um and yeah I can't wait to see if you guys only have any questions but yeah thank you so much for having me I am Shelly I am one of the team who organized tonight I had the pleasure of introducing Jennifer McShane Jennifer is an editor and a journalist and has done many different articles and has specialised in branded and social media events. So I'm going to hand over to Jennifer. We're delighted to have you, Stephen. Thank you so much. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, my connection's not super. Um, but I am a disabled white woman. Um, I have cerebral palsy. I have uh, long brown hair. And I'm wearing a red top with a uh, red matching lipstick. It's one of my little things to do is to always match the top that I'm wearing to my lipstick. <laughs> and that's about as stylish as I probably get. Um, but I'm just thrilled um, to be here this evening and to be hearing from all these uh, incredible speakers. Um, and I'm based in London, though I'm Irish, um, working as an editor and journalist for the past 12 years, I would say. Um, at the moment, I am mainly an editorial content producer at, at Tate in London. And I'm also co-chair of its Disability Network, um, its Disability Network there. And one of the things that drew me to London among many was um, the job would take not just because of the job but also because of the company's stance on diversity and hiring people uh, with disabilities. I found from the outset of the application process that they actively uh, were very open and encouraging about wanting to know about any adjustments that you might need really early on not just as a box ticking exercise but because they knew themselves that the sector was underrepresented in terms of those with disabilities. So that was a big push in, in my wanting to kind of take the opportunity to travel and live in another city. 
Um, but a lot of the another main reason I decided to emigrate um, was because I felt after living for, you know, 30 years in Ireland that lot in terms of the disability policies they have going on on a personal level, though, I very much wanted to stay and champion the, the fight for everyone that has made Ireland their home. I felt personally that it was just getting too difficult to live here. Um, I am um, uh, a wheel. I do use a wheelchair. I mainly use a K walker. I'm unable to drive. Um, I cannot walk any sort of distance. Um, so my main method of transport, for example, was always taxis. Um, I lived about an hour from the city centre and it would cost a fortune, like 50, 60 euros each way just to get in and out. I felt that there's massive problems with the welfare system, as we know, uh, when it comes to disability and that every single thing is means tested. And, you know, and housing is another huge thing. I could never I wanted to live an independent life and I could never find first and foremost anything reasonable as a challenge for everyone, but also from a disability perspective, from an access needs, just finding a ground floor flat became impossible. And eventually those three factors if I wanted to up my quality of life, I felt I had to try um, and and see if I could find that elsewhere. Um, and I chose London because A, I didn't want to move too far. And um, B, the work opportunity was there with Tate, which offered me, you know, um, a, a really good reason to kind of get stuck in. But also certain kind of policies, the way in the way the government deals with them. Uh, now, it's not without its problems. Believe me, there's a huge amount of problems over there with the system that they have. But certain things are more geared towards those with disabilities. For example, you can get a freedom pass, which means you don't pay for any travel over there on the, in publicly. All the buses, and I mean all of them, are always accessible they're frequent every two or three minutes there's always a bus around you and I don't mean like my nearest one at home would be 20 minutes there's one around the corner and even though their welfare system you are able to work full-time and still be eligible for benefits that would actually make a difference into a person's life and in that way I feel it's a city that is far more geared towards accessibility than Dublin is um, I think if you can drive, it puts you at a great disadvantage or a great advantage, should I say. But if you can't, and I'll never be able to due to the cerebral palsy, I suppose I felt stuck. And now that I am uh, over in London on a, you know, pretty much I'm uh, for a while I was between both places. But now I am pretty much here in London as my as my home. Now, what I like to try and do is champion the pluses to that, what we could do as an Irish government is take a lot of is take a lot of what the UK do well and there's much they don't do well but there is a lot they do really really well including that system where you are able to work full-time and get awarded something where they say we won't review it for 10 years because we know this condition is not going anywhere where the public transport it's not an afterthought that it's accessible. It must be accessible where there are schemes like taxi schemes where you can, you know, get money off taxis. There, it's very much a life geared towards at least the, the seeking of independence from what I found for those with disabilities. Whereas I find still in Ireland, despite many attempts, it's very much, you know, we haven't progressed in that way. I think the pandemic was very was a clear indicator of that where the pub payment was 350 was seen the minimum to live on but yet the disability benefits remain at what 200 a week maybe at a push 250 so I feel there is a lot to be done and rather than you know and I struggled with feelings of guilt that I you know I should have stayed I should have tried I should have made, found a way to make it work. Whereas now I think you can have I think you can do both you can want to better your life and have an easier life and use the platform you have to talk about the issues that, you know, Ireland could implement. Um, I write, I still freelance in my, you know, part time and I write a lot about the disability tax, the invisible expenses that, you know, disabled people must, you know, have. They rack up uh, in order just to live the same life as as non-disabled people, you know, whether that's, you know, and you still have to be your own advocate. Don't get me wrong. You know, I still I'm trying to get new uh, AFOs made here. I need a new K-Walker. I need steroid injections for chronic pain that I'm having. You very much 
still have to be your own advocate, but you feel that there are options here. I felt there was a lot of walls when I tried at home and I just merely for size as well. It's a bigger place, but I just feel that it's more um, open in a lot of ways. I mean, disability isn't seen as something other and not that it's seen as other in Ireland, but it's just seen as, oh, you know, you need access for this right you know here it is just it's that way instead and whereas in Ireland sometimes they can look at you and go what what access so it was a big reason in my wanting to to see the other side of the coin and also I do hope to move back to Ireland someday and I want I want to see tangible change you know what but any kind of re, any kind of real change tends to take time but I think of everybody like the incredible people do here can use uh, their voices and platforms to push for things like from Louise I've always loved like less in Dublin and I'm delighted to hear that you are charging I will pay <laughs> I don't want it for free I would happily contribute it was always amazing um I'm ha- like those are the things that we can do because it's not we are not the people that need educating necessarily um it is it is everyone outside and that includes government bodies I don't want The disabled community in Ireland should not feel like we shouldn't be an afterthought. We should be just thought of in every kind of in all the needs that we need from the get go, from early on. And that means education. It starts, you know, you normalize what you see. And that starts from a very young age that starts in school. It starts with with education. It starts with there being actual policy in government and, you know, bodies and representatives to really enact that policy. Um, And, you know, living in another in another country gives you you know a hope of that there are many things that you know for example the UK does not do well and we won't even get started but um when it comes to access and disability there's a lot that I think we could learn from that um and I suppose I want to to write about it more to get the message out there and just to to really give I suppose hope to other people that things you know things can change things can get better and there's no reason you shouldn't um there's no reason you shouldn't go outside the box if you feel that you might have um a life that is more suited to you and your needs thank you Jenny that's fantastic thank you so much it was a pleasure thank you so my name is Nina um I um have green eyes I have long dark hair um, I describe myself as white and middle-aged and proud of it. Um, or also I could say that I'm in my prime. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Sarah Gordy, MBE, who is an actress. Sarah is known for her roles in Ralph and Katie, The A Word, Upstairs, Downstairs, Call the Midwife and Holby City. She has acted in TV, short films, radio dramas, commercials, and many, many theatre productions. So I'd like to hand over to Sarah now, please. Thank you. Hello, I am Sarah Goldie. I am only five feet tall. I have Down syndrome with light brown hair. My skin is pale and my eyes are bluey green. I am wearing a red sweater. Nanya t- tells me you guys are really interested in hearing about my life. That is lovely. Perhaps you want to know why I wanted to be an actor. When I was very little, my mother and my grandmother used to tell us stories. We would make up stories and I was always Princess Moonbeam and my sister was Princess Sunbeam. We made masks and did plays for my family and friends. We were very happy. At school, I loved to be in plays, but 
but I never dreamt I would be a professional actor one day. Somehow, a casting director heard about me and asked me to audition for BBC TV. I was 19. Mum said this would be fun, even if it, if I did not get the job, the audition would be fun. And it was. Afterwards, we went to the pub and had a pint. We had a great day in London. A week later, I got the call. I had got the job. Wow. I spent ages learning lines. It was three weeks of filming. A big job. So exciting. I had wonderful time. I took it to it like a duck to water. Everybody was happy with my work and the critics liked me. I thought to myself, acting is what I want to do. But after filming, everything went silent for ages. I didn't know that Lisa Evans has been asked to write my first professional play. So my next job was a play in a big theatre in the the new thick Newcastle underline. The theatre was in in the round. That means the stage was in the middle, and the audience is all around the stage. I felt totally at home there. I was so alive. So not. Is the beginning of my career. After that, I did a lot of TV, like Casualty, Doctors, Hobby City, and then got roles on primetime TV, like Corner Midwife, Strug Mysteries, and The A Word. Katie in Rough and Katie was my first lead role on Prime Time TV. It was the greatest fun, hard work, but I loved every moment. Wolf was played by my good friend, Leon Harrop. He is like a brother to me, and I can't wait to work with him again. Not TV, but I was doing other things as well. Variety is a spice of life. I have done a lot of theatre. A couple of my favourites are a second production of my first play, Once We Were Mothers at the Orange Tree Theatre, Richmond. I also played the lead role in Jellyfish at the Bush Theatre, which then went on to do to a second production at the National Theatre. Stepping on stage in the leading role at the National Theatre was my dream come true. Also love making radio plays. I am working on a new one right now. I have also danced 
at the Royal Opera House in London and in other Euro cities. Done a bit of photographic modeling. I am very fortunate lady. Keeping fit is very important to me. Working out to YouTube exercising videos, which cost nothing. I try to avoid biscuits and junk food. I usually have a little box of cashews in my bag when I am working, just in case I am hungry. And I want to avoid bad stuff. I hope you are all having a good time tonight. I enjoy my visit to Ireland. I always have fun. Thank you for being interested in my life. I love you. Oh, Sarah, that was amazing. So Thank you. And amazing. Thank you. So hi, hi. Oh, she had the light and sparkly and oh, how are you? Thank you. I'm good. I got them in America actually. I of saw it on Instagram. Did. Of course you did. <laughs> I'm good. I'm so happy that I'm here. Uh mm -hmm. hearing every, hearing the speakers um talk is very inspirational, I I have to say. Um it makes me feel very, very motivated and make me want to conquer my dreams. So thank you uh, to the speakers. Um, I ha have to apologize. I'm still in my pajamas. I nearly didn't come, but I said, oh. sure, nobody will see me, it'll be grand. But I'm so glad I came. It's just so wonderful. And it's so wonderful to have this group, all of us here tonight, sharing and talking and sometimes we just need to do that for ourselves. So listen, it was just a fabulous night and you have lifted my heart and soul so much, all of you. And thank you. And thank you, ILMI, for doing this because it's just fun. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Ronnie, thank you so much. And like, I was wondering how we were going to finish this. And um, like, like for you, it's such Brilliant speakers and I, Elaine, I'm a huge fan of, of artificial intelligence and rights and how we can make that work for disabled people and not for service providers. So we'll be in contact. So you're um, Shelby. Oh my God. Yeah, I don't know what to say because I'm a fashion addicted. Disabled woman that loved her. As I said, I love my shoes and my handbags and everything else that goes with it. And and it is part of our identity and and body confidence. We can look how amazing all of us are, even if we're in pajamas. <laughs> Grania, even if we're in pajamas, we can look amazing. So we can. And um, amazing. And Louise, thank you for talking about it. And like, you know, the difficulty around using our lived experience to make change and it's not okay. So it's not, I'm being paid for our expertise and it's essential. I and mean, we you know I and I are really committed to the lived experience and like the professional experience disabled people can bring to all you know realms of life so thank you so much for that and and yeah like and i hope i'm not caprice yeah brilliant thank you thank you earrings i'm going to look you up and your rings i can't wait to see so i can't i really can jennifer Thank you for talking about quality of life. And because quality of life is in our DNA, we all want to live our best lives. And it's so important to talk about 
our accommodations as disabled women and and like and the comparison between living in Ireland and Britain and how different it can be like politicians and everybody else to how non-disabled needs to start listening. We are the experts and like things need to be changed. Things need to change. But we can do it, but we can do it together and collectively.